I do want to say. I, I do want to say uh, to all of you that not only are you having a great time and tackling some of the toughest issues that there are in the world, but you also have achieved a certain degree of, uh, of contemporary currency in that this morning, um, Peace Game has been sort of trending on social media. And that in fact, for a while there, it was trending in DC and um, there have been more than 1,300 tweets with this hashtag today, almost all of them admittedly from Andrew. Um, uh, but, yeah, but, 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 but having said that, you know, some, one, one of the questions was, will the sessions be recorded and available to watch later? The sessions are actually streaming. There are some people watching, streaming. Somebody said it was you know, streaming into some offices which suggests to me that some people don't have enough work to do. But in any event, because if I had people working for me that were spending all day watching streaming video of this conference, I'd be a little disturbed. Um, but uh, it is recorded and it'll be available to watch on the web. And then, you know, there's a variety of different tweets. This was handed to me by the social media people here. And one of them says something about me, which I'm skip over it, although it says, no, no, it's nice. Why, why do you assume that I'm skipping over it? Because it's not nice. It was very nice. I didn't want to be self-serving. And it ends, hope you can eat too, which I assume it's from my mother. But um, and, and somebody else said, peace game is fascinating. Yes, it's Petri dish diplomacy, but how great if as much energy went into peace games as war. And somebody else said on session one of USIP's peace, peace game, great community of experts. Hope later talk uh, moves to more talk about second order effects of deal and making processes. And then, um, of course, here's Andrew tweeting. Halfway through peace game day one and Rhonda Slim and I playing Hezbollah are winning the hell out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so and before we go any further, does anybody have any comments? <laughs> um, and then there's one here saying Dana Stuster is doing an, a fantastic job live tweeting Peace Game, but his spiffy new Twitter avatar is making me feel inadequate. Look, folks, if your Twitter avatar is so closely related to your identity that it can make you feel inadequate, turn it off. Turn off the phone. You are too connected to social media. Um, in any event, it's good that there's some buzz out there about all this. Uh, let's now move on to the next um, session uh, and the next phase, which is called Building a Sustained Peace. Uh, and I, and I, we're gonna, I'll talk about how we tackle this first, but let's go through the couple of slides that we've got. Um, to, f to frame it, following a negotiated settlement, and admittedly, we didn't actually arrive at a negotiated settlement, but there is certainly, the, one of the possibilities that we discussed was that there might be one. Uh, then there's several daunting tasks, one being disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Second one being restoration of governance. The third one being economic reconstruction. And the fourth being refugee return and resettlement. Um, now, again, we'll probably not be able to get through all the dimensions of all of these here, uh, but we'll certainly start with a couple of them. Go on. Uh, uh, well, this is just, you know, adds a little bit of color. Uh, Leon Panetta said, I think it's important when Assad leaves to try to preserve stability, and the best way to preserve that kind of stability is to maintain as much of the military, the police, as you can, along with security forces, and hope they will transition to a democratic form of government. Uh, those of you who are following your programs will know this is a veiled uh, follow-up to what we did in Iraq, right? This is, this is essentially a comment about the debathification, um, without saying as much. Next. Uh, in terms of disarmament, demobilization, reintegration, you know, there, there are a bunch of domestic obstacles to it. First of all, the opposition groups, as we've discovered here, are diverse, um, and some of them are radicalized. Uh, somebody, you, you made a comment earlier, and I just, I, I'm going to give you a microphone. 
and I'm going to give you 45 seconds. Um, but just make the comment about how some of the opposition is changing, because it goes back to the point about it being dynamic. Is, the, is it on, the microphone on? OK, go ahead. Thank you. So I said we've been oblivious to two major veto. I said we've been obli oblivious to two major veto players. We have lumped everyone um, under Isl Islamist extremists. You have the Islamic Front. Sixty thousand recently came into was recently established. Sixty thousand uh, strong fighters spread all over Syria. So that's a force to reckon with, and they're a major veto player. You need to keep thinking of, about them. And then there's also the PYD, PYG, the Syrian version of the PKK. They have ambitions for a semi-autonomous or an autonomous region, and there's a sub-conflict between them and the armed, uh, Arab armed opposition, so you also need to keep that in mind. So it's not just the Islam, Islamic State of Iraq and Sham. Um, there's also the Islamic Front, and you need to keep uh, thinking, you need to think about them, because if they say no, then you're gonna, you're gonna run in trouble. Okay, I, thanks. I well, Maybe. just because a microphone was passed in front of you doesn't mean you can... <laughs> okay, it, show, it shows a lot of restraints since you have two microphones. Please take those away from him almost immediately. No, no, go on. So you you may use you one of them, use one of them, use one of them briefly. Okay, one of them briefly. Works. I, I would just add, the, if you're talking about the opposition, the military dynamics of the conflict will drive the peace process and that has not been talked about enough. And to the extent that the United States uh, refuses or does not wish to get involved with the, with the conflict, you're, you're basically setting the terms for the peace in a very disadvantageous way for the opposition. Okay, thank you. So anyway, the opposition groups are diverse, they're radicalized, or some of them are certainly radicalized. Uh, and uh, in terms of the regime-affiliated state security apparatus, the armed forces serve as regime protectorate, as well as potential stabilizing force. Uh, and there is, of course, a potential for some or all of the armed forces to continue fighting. Next. Uh, in terms of, of the d disarmament phase, the destruction of chemical weapons and the need for peacekeeping will require some sustained international involvement, something we may want to deal with in the context of this. We do have international peacekeepers and others who uh, n now might get more involved in this discussion. Next. Um, uh, my, my, Mike O'Hanlon said, the Syrian government built around the Ba'ath Party and the Assad family does not have a great deal of institutional depth. We can challenge that or not as we go. Next. Uh, in terms of restoration of government, societal fragmentation, there's a theme here clearly, um, is that despite the ethnic and religious diversity, uh, there is a clear large Sunni Arab majority which complicates any future discussions on power sharing and the protection of minority rights. Sunni Arabs make up about 60% of Syria's population. Uh, and of course, you know, there is this bigger Sunni-Shia tension throughout the region. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is the failure to address this issue could end up exacerbating uh, that tension and actually contributing to the spread of a kind of a region-wide conflict. Uh, in fact, I've spoken to some people who have argued that we're actually in the middle of a region-wide conflict now, and it could actually be the intensification of that conflict, uh, which would then lead to much uh, greater kind of issues and challenges. Next. Um, in terms of political re restoration, uh, you know, it says institutions and democracy. Syria has a long history of weak institutions and stifled political culture, making consensus building and political restoration uh, an arduous task. Um, I, you know, I mean, clearly we can debate this. If you've got one family that's been ruling the country for a long time, then some of the institutions aren't so weak. Uh, in terms of doing what they're supposed to be doing and in terms of um, uh, responsiveness to public need, that's another issue. Um, uh, how one goes forward from that, particularly if that regime has some role in what's going forward, uh, is poses some interesting challenges that we'll get to. Next. Um, Okay, another, an, another quote. We'll skip over that. And you can read these later. In terms of economic reconstruction, you know, the conflict has caused absolutely devastating, devastating consequences economically, uh, whether it's agricultural yields falling to less than half of pre-conflict levels, the deindustrialization, 75% of production facilities in Aleppo, for example, are no longer operable. GDP has essentially been... Uh, you know, I mean, eradicated. It's 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 quite striking. 
Uh, the oil industry is at a standstill with 95% decline production. Uh, decline in production. Most, most of the public infrastructure has been destroyed, including 600,000 homes, 3,500 schools, universities, hospitals, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, there's big price tags associated with that. And then the next, um, in terms of structural challenges, you know, you've got youth unemployment at 50% roughly. Uh, you've got about an $80 billion rebuilding cost. Uh, you've got income inequality. Uh, growing there, um, and uh, it's it's growing fairly rapidly, uh, as as is the group of people in poverty. Next, um, uh, again another quote which you can read later, um, and then finally, uh, in terms of refugee return and resettlement. Um, refugees threaten regional stability. Clearly, that's one of the region reasons that countries like. Uh, Jordan, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, and so forth are extremely concerned about this uh, uh, and uh, how one gets those refugees back, uh, if one can get those refugees back, um, uh, is, is, is as complicated a logistical challenge as any associated with this uh, 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 process. Next. Um, it, it, part of this is restoring specific communities. Uh, and by the way, part of, you know, there's a political consequence to where the refugees go back to and, you know, w which areas are empowered and, and so forth. They're, you know, coordinating refugee return is also coordinating the political future of different parts of the country. Next, is there, is, there's no, so that's it. So let's go to the questions very quickly. Again, five questions. What's the biggest challenge Syria will face after a potential political settlement is achieved? Armed groups with uh, competing interests, restoring basic state functions, repairing economic infrastructure, refugee return and resettlement, or distributing humanitarian aid and services? And again, if there's another one that we haven't covered here, let us know. So armed groups with competing interests is the dominant answer. Is there another one that somebody here wanted to? OK, sure. Yeah, I think one of the things, it falls a little bit under the first one, but you're going to have a lot of different groups, armed or not, who are going to be competing over access to these resources as they flow in. Um, and I think that's something that we're really going to need to think about in the reconstruction phase and hasn't been thought about enough. OK. I also think, by the way, we should just flag, or at least I want to flag that you know, because no one said distributing humanitarian aid and services, you could draw a couple of conclusions from that. One is that nobody thinks that's the biggest problem because, you know, it falls behind all the other problems that exist. But secondly, I, I think that suggests exactly w what will create problems in that area because as it's sort of put at the back of the train, it's going to get under addressed and underserved and underutilized and under um, funded. Next. What's the biggest obstacle to achieving disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration following an agreement? Fractured opposition, lack of public trust and peace agreement, sustained sectarian tensions, widespread appetite for revenge and retribution, or flow of arms and support from regional backers? So, sustained sectarian tensions leads the way with flow of arms and support from regional backers being second. Uh, I, I think that those two things are clearly related to one another, so uh, one might see them as overlapping to some extent. Next. What's the most important aspect of restoring governance that must occur in post-war Syria? Constitutional review, reestablishment of state services and rule of law, developing transitional justice mechanisms, decentralizing power to the regions, allowing for public participation in the process. And in your view, the answer to this is reestablishing state services and rule of law um, with decentralization and allowing for public participation following up as the next two. Um, interesting to the extent to which constitutional review lags all of these things. 
Next. After political settlement is achieved, which of the following economic issues is most pressing? Integration of combatants into the workforce, lifting of economic sanctions, encouraging domestic and foreign investment, immediate repair of infrastructure, or restoring trade relationships? Uh, Fifty percent saying immediate repair of infrastructure, and 32 percent saying integration of combatants into the workforce. That's, we could come back to that. I'm not sure that's correct, actually. Um, not that. I, I was, well, what is know, the correct answer? Look, look. You speak for Turkey. You speak for the United States. I will speak for what's right and wrong. Um, uh, and, and finally. What is the largest hurdle in return and resettlement of refugees? A, loss of property records uh, and homes, donor fatigue and limited international involvement, sectarian violence and acts of revenge, absence of social, medical, and educational services. Again, sectarian violence and acts of revenge. So let's 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 talk a little bit about this. Let's talk about two components. Why we didn't achieve a peace agreement in this last session. We sort of arrived at a couple of possibilities. One of which is a deal might be struck. You know, if we could get whether we call it the royal flush or we could take Kristen's analysis and say, well, we might get one or two components of this. We might get Iran to put some pressure on, or Iran and Russia to put some pressure on and you might get Assad to leave, but you will probably end up in that situation with some rump, uh, you know, Assad regime as a player going forward in this process alongside some other players. Um, and I think the core, or, you know, you don't have a deal. The Assad regime remains in place. The fighting continues on. Uh, the other parties fight, and then you might have something that's resolved as a result of military pressure or entropy or some other f factor. Um, but I think all, both of these things are related to, you know, how power gets meted out and what the, the governing structure of the country looks like um, post either a deal or even post a failed deal and moving towards a best possible piece that does not actually involve a deal. How, how do you split up power? Is it possible, and I'm going to go back to you, Steve, since you framed this thing again, but is it possible to envision, realistically, a unitary government, you know, for Syria, you know, that, co that covers the whole state, and in which the opposition groups and some successor to the Assad regime, or the, well, I don't think it, we can work with the Assad regime as it's currently constituted, but some successor, uh, share power? I think it's possible. I think the odds of success of that kind of an outcome will depend very heavily on the specific functions um, that are assigned to various state institutions and the division of labor between uh, former regime figures and opposition figures that emerges within each of those institutions. For example, I could imagine fairly quick movement toward the reconstruction of state institutions responsible for the provision of basic services, which is a critical element in creating conditions that will move Syria quickly toward some, some, something resembling normalcy. I can see much slower, more difficult, and more contentious uh, processes surrounding building accepted divisions of labor uh, within a newly restructured uh, Syrian armed forces, uh, within um, a redesigned uh, intelligence apparatus whose functions, one hopes, will have changed in a post-Assad or post-transition Syria. So I think if we can disaggregate the various roles, functions, authorities, responsibilities of state institutions, 
I can imagine a number of arenas in which it will be possible to see fairly fairly rapid movement toward the reemergence of, of effective state functioning and basic services on the basis of division of labor between regime figures and, and their opposition counterparts and others in which those kinds of understandings will be very difficult to achieve. Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about power sharing and who shares with whom and who comes out on top and how that looks, okay? Andrew, you've thought a little bit about this. Talk, 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 talk a little bit about how you think that would look. Um, it's a very good question. Power sharing was Prior sharing. to this, Andrew came up to me and said, you should ask that question because I think it's a very good question, and that's why <laughs> I've asked it. <laughs> well, I was, it actually was generated out of a conversation that, that Morhoff and I were having in the, um, in the break, and it, it's, it, it, it's an incredibly tricky situation because you're looking at, if you're talking about a power sharing agreement that, that encompasses the entire country, you'd have to be looking at sides that were willing to make significant compromise, uh, you know, uh, real changes to their position. And I think in order to integrate the opposition back into to a centralized structure, the Assad family and the Makhlouf's in particular would have to would have to go. The problem that I see is that we see nothing forcing that happening. You know, um, why uh, would they be if they're not in a situation where they uh, they stay and die or go and live? I don't really see them. You know, anything forcing that absent a military intervention that we don't see. Um, also, on the other hand, I don't see what also forces the um, we, there would have to be um, an arrangement. Um, from the opposition side as well, particularly among the extremists, I think Mona has outlined this, um, uh, in terms of uh, they, they would have to make some concessions or members of their groups would have to be peeled off and brought on to um, to, to the more moderate factions. Um, and uh, and I just don't see it. So in, I think in the, in, the, um, in the short term, it just, it perpetuates this idea in my mind that Syria will in, in fact be in a de, de facto state of partition for some time. How would that look? Um, I think it'll look something we actually, uh, Karina and I were having a conversation as well. Um, hope you don't mind, uh, I'll just refer to it. But we were trying, after we were discussing what it looked like, and if you look at these maps, um, right now it seems as if both sides are trying to solidify their um, lines of control. Um, and you can see in some areas the lines of control smoothing out, the contours between the two sides. It's much less like a mosaic and more like just a messy watercolor. Um, but then, um, but then, going forward, it, you know, people have said, well, it, because Syria and Yugo the former Yugoslavia are roughly the same population, and you have the sectarian dimension, they, they they point to that. Actually, it seems as if, and I agree with Karina's point, was that it looks something closer to Somalia, um, particularly given the the role of extremists, and actually, that this conflict just goes on, and it just sort of settles out into a divided. Um, country in which there are some areas yeah, that's, with... That's the process, but what, what does it look like? What does it look like on the map? I think it. I think it does not look like the Syrian Arab Republic as as I lived in it, um, as, and is currently the Sykes-Picot borders. Um, I, that doesn't mean I don't think Syrians want that Syria to stay in one piece. I think they do, and I would prefer it as well. But I think it would look like a um, like a um, uh, like a messy watercolor. Uh, Okay. Karina, future. he was speaking on your behalf, and he asserted you said I, all sorts of things. I, I, I hope I did okay. So, so, <laughs> but just, do, do you have a, I mean, what I really want to get at here is, what does the power sharing look like? And there's two ways we can approach this, within a government or in a partitioned country. I mean, you know, those are kind of the two ways it can shake out. And I'm just wondering what your view is. It's very difficult because it depends on when is it that this situation solidifies, solidifies and what areas are consolidated. But in many ways, for a lo very long time, humanitarian and uh, all sorts of international workers uh, from the Secretariat and outside have been talking about there's no continuum between um, peace and war, uh, but there is continuum in terms of areas that coexist at the same time with different degrees of violence and with different degrees of institutional control. And so in many ways, you could eventually consider a map of, in the worst case scenario, a map of Syria, 
where some areas are consolidated and you have the Somali lands and company of this world and the others that are absolutely out of control, uh, ruled by uh, clans, families, and that's the worst case scenario for, for, for Syria. Well, it may be the worst, but if it's the best possible case, that's what we're interested in. In other words, it may be a bad case, yeah. but, you know, again, maybe one of you guys. I, I, and what I really want to get at here is what do we think it looks like? What does either power sharing look like within a, a government or what does a fragmented Syria look like? I mean, you can address either one of those because they're both sort of parallel scenarios that we... Okay, have. I think we'd all agree that right now we have a very fragmented opposition to Assad. It's been mentioned the Islamic Front, Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS outside of the Islamic Front, more or less. Uh, you have the Free Syrian Army, the Syrian National Council. What what I think could happen is warlordism, because I think if the Assads go, you do have clans. I never thought the Alawites were monolithic. You do have clans among the Alawites. And I don't think that the Alaw Alawite officer corps is monolithic. And I think that, it, that when and if the Assads go, uh, despite the best laid plans of great powers, et cetera, this might devolve into uh, a free-for-all. Uh, and, you know, I, but in, I don't in like the context of what we're talking about, there are some likely bad cases. But in terms of the best possible piece, let's just take that a second. Is there, are, are there possible arrangements there that are more stable than other arrangements? You were talking about there are some parts of the country that might remain fairly stable, and then there'll be some parts that are in almost constant conflict. But that might be as good as you can get in the first phase, and then you might have to go in and squeeze the places that are in conflict, right? And I'm just wondering, yeah. is there a sort of a, 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 a you know, well, semi-stable right, approach? Right now, you have a semi-stable area along the coast, Tartus, Latakia, and the coastal mountains that the Alawites and their Christian allies uh, dominate. There are Sunni populations, large Sunni populations in Latakia and all. But the ethnic cleansing at the moment is not going on there. It's it's. Uh, so that's one sort of region. That's one region and that is potentially semi-stable. Kurdish regions might be semi-stable unto themselves. Also, right. And in that and in that western area, which I think Ambassador Ted's talked about, you know, you have a situation that you know, what would be the ideal, perhaps um, uh, some kind of deal between, um, for lack of a better term. Um, Alawites with guns who are not in the core of the regime and the more moderate factions of the opposition. Um, we, we don't see that yet, but I think in either whatever scenario comes out, you're going to have large swaths of Syria that are ungoverned spaces, and that's the real problem of the argument of, well, why don't we just go back and re-engage Assad or cut a deal with Assad that, you know, eat, uh, the control over the country, we have to accept that, that control going forward is, is going to be very loose, particularly out east. Let me ask a question. The, oh, as far as the polling, did you, you teed up a, like a, a true-false or something like that? Did, what, a yes-no? Just either one of them is fine. Okay, just ignore what the words say. But listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I, I just like to get a temperature of the room kind of quickly. A means you think that power sharing within some kind of government apparatus is a poss is the best possible outcome over the course of the next ten years, right? In other words, you think you could get there, or B you think that a fragmented state is the best possible outcome. In other words, within a government or multiple actors within the borders? No. I just, which is most likely, excuse me? Which is, which is the most likely scenario? I know, I just said most likely. So, you know, like, you know, it was the right question, you're right. So let's just say most likely. So A is within a government, B is, is, is fragmentation. OK, so I mean, that's you know, interesting in a group like this that is immersed in this issue that 60% of the group 
thinks that over the course of the next 10 years, fragmented country is more likely. Did you have something else you wanted to say? Sure. Do you want to say something really quickly while very, I'm walking very, past you? Very, very quickly. We can imagine a pathway to power sharing emerging out of some kind of a negotiation. The question is what the division of authority would look like at the national level, assuming an, integ an, an integral Syrian state. And I think my own sense is that the most likely outcome is what I would call a Zimbabwe solution. In oh, which, that sounds great. In which, in which uh, well, we're talking about best possible, best possible, in which a governing party will continue to hold power over major state institutions. The opposition will occupy the role of Morgan Shangarai. It will participate in government, will be relatively weak. Um, but will c uh, consider that it has greater incentives to remain inside the game than to opt out. Okay, that's a very interesting point. And, you know, there is a hierarchy of potential outcomes here. And what we're saying, I mean, I, I don't want to conclude the discussion, but, you know, that the most likely seems to be fragmented state within a, uh, uh, an in uh, a, a uh, integrated government that perhaps the most likely, or what you're suggesting, is one where the dominant role is played by the regime or successor, and the opposition is in a secondary role. And it's actually, you know, the, 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 you know, the sort of the third possibility, or the sort of least, or le less likely possibility, is the one that you hear more of in terms of, you know, uh, high-minded policy discussions, where there's some kind of representative, balanced, um, uh, uh, movement towards a democratic representative government. Sharon. Yeah, I'm speaking here as an international relief and development organization that does a lot of governance work in these kinds of uh, places. Um, you know, I think the discussion around ungoverned spaces um, ignores the fact that there very is often governance in those spaces. Um, and I think one of the best possible outcomes, um, the international community is very often focused on the formal structures of governance, and it's ignored ignored many of the informal structures of governance. And so if we're looking at a fragmented type of future, um, I think one of the best possible outcomes is to really think about how do we strengthen governance um, that brings together the formal and the informal in these different areas. Um, again, it's a very decentralized form of governance. Yeah, but that's, an, again, it's an interesting approach, right? That if you're gonna have a broken country and it's in different pieces, it's gonna have different kinds of governance, and instead of seeking one kind of governance solution, you might seek the best possible governance solution within each of the fragmented regions. Peter, did you want to say something? Okay, Henri. Uh, I would say, I mean, I agree with Sharon, but also, also I would argue that what happens in Syria is not going to be determined by Syria only, and we have to look at Iraq. Because the fragmented government, the fragmented state uh, uh, option that we're talking about is also very, very likely in Iraq, and that's going to have spillover effects and that spillover effect is going to go both ways. So I think Syria alone in this particular case uh, is not determinative. We have to think about Iraq as well. Yeah, very, very, very interesting thing. Uh, we'll go to Daniel and then we'll go to Mar. Well, I just put in my head as somebody who studies these power sharing arrangements as part of what I do professionally. You know, my sense is that, first of all, there's no necessary contradiction between having a, a, a more fragmented state and some sort of parallel formal power sharing arrangement. But power sharing, and these, of course, you study this as well, power sharing uh, arrangements of the kind that we're thinking of in a more formal way are hard to maintain unless there's an enforcer, unless there's a third party there that it, it really is able to provide the support militarily and uh, on the ground. And that would revolve around the international community. So I can't see, particularly in the context of Syria, formal power sharing work working without a long-term commitment from the international community to, uh, to play that role as third party enforcer. Did, did you want to add something to that? I, I will, um, not as a UN peacekeeper, but as somebody who studies ethnic power sharing also. <laughs> That's, that, um, sounds, that sounds like the easier of the two options. Uh, yeah, but, it, it, the, the, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've mentioned Northern Ireland and, and Bosnia, Lebanon, Iraq, Kosovo. Uh, these are all rigid ethnic power sharing arrangements that often require third party uh, assistance in order for the governments to function. And if we're looking to Southern Africa for examples, um, let's just talk about South Africa as opposed to Zimbabwe. 
the, the armed resistance, that the opposition is armed in Syria, yeah, unlike, exactly. unlike, unlike in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe where it's not armed. So exactly. Changarai doesn't, isn't yeah. about to it's take not. over by force, whereas in South Africa, actually, the resistance was armed. And um, what, they, what they worked out in South Africa was a temporary power sharing arrangement. They had a sunset clause. And that meant that they could actually transition to a democracy, whereas in the, uh, in the settlements where there's no sunset clause, you get Bosnia. I mean, we don't, it, it, in other words, when there's no hope of transitioning beyond the rigid ethnic power sharing arrangement, you're left with rigid ethnic power sharing and not a unified country. Actually, that, that comment was much more articulate, but that was along the lines of what I was going to say, which is many of the things that have been described, Somalia, warlordism, a cantonized Syria, to my mind, those are all symptoms of, of failed power sharing. And if the question is, what is the best case, I would think you have to, I, I love this idea of the, of the temporary notion and then the eventual, with the idea of a transition toward democracy, but clearly issues like guarantees for minorities have to be in there some degree perhaps of decentralized power in particular instances and for me the question is you know how do you deal with the sense of existential threat that is now intimately tied with identity and are there ways to negotiate solutions to that well in your capacity as <laughs> the head of the radical armenian resistance in <laughs> in in, uh, in in syria is there any incentive for the groups that you're speaking on behalf of in this discussion to, to sort of go along with any organized approach? No, but the, the groups that I represent, now I'm taking my Armenian hat off and I'm putting my very staunchly jihadist hat on, they're not interested in Assyria. They're interested in a, in a much broader transnational uh, idea of the restoration of a caliphate. They are where they believe they should be. Let's not forget Damascus is the seat of the Umayyads and this is where they this is where they get their inspiration from. But they have zero interest in any notion of Assyria. They don't even recognize the idea of a nation state. So they're they're not really part of that discussion. So one of the questions here, if you end up with a power sharing arrangement, you end up with uh, uh, a need to sort of stabilize that and that requires an outside a set of actors to do that, and is is that there be a reason for those outside actors to come in and exert that role? Um, and if it's the international community, um, uh, for example, um, as it's traditionally constituted, uh, the the question is, what's the reason? And let me, I'd like to ask a question. Maybe I could ask you, Jim. Um, it, it goes to the point that Mona's Mon made, and some other people have made, which is we we're talking here about Syria, but Iraq is part of this discussion, and uh, frankly, fragmentation and redrawing of the borders within this entire region of the world seems to be a bigger issue. And the question is, if you get this wrong, and you've got this kind of weakened um, uh, ebb and flow going on within Iraq, should the United States and other Western powers really be looking at this and saying, we can't afford to stay as hands off as we've been. We can't afford to let the chips fall where they may, because we could really end up with something that redrew the lines here in a way that would be materially more dangerous. Um, yeah, borders wind up being a bit stickier than uh, you might think they would. Uh, a lot of argumentation could go into uh, how does Iraq hold together, and it somehow holds together, including the Kurdish North, which has a lot of other options. Uh, and that's partially a sort of residual commitment that people have other than the jihadists, many of whom, of course, are uh, people who've come in from the outside. Uh, and uh, that was the same case in Iraq. But the people who are natives of the country tend to be, uh, have some residual identity with that state uh, beyond their ethnic or religious uh, background. Uh, then um, the other thing is, uh, if you go in, uh, then you have to be prepared to go in really hard and big and long. That's what we did in Kosovo. That's what we did in Bosnia. It's not what we did in Iraq, as it turns out, and it doesn't look like what we're do going to be doing in Afghanistan. Uh, and the difference is uh, we were met with fierce resistance in both places uh, in the Middle East. We weren't met with fierce resistance in uh, uh, Bosnia and Kosovo. We would be met with fierce resistance in uh, Syria. So we have to think twice about that. Well, this, this gets to an absolutely sort of core question 
about how, how do we go forward um, with this. Well, actually, I see Peter's brought that up, but I'm going to pose the question to you, which is, does the United States, act, you know, is there any likelihood that the United States would actively be involved in whatever was necessary to stabilize this situation, or the international community actively be involved in whatever is necessary to stabilize this situation? Or if that's not the case, then what does that say about what the situation is likely to end up with? Peter. Um, I just consulted with my civil society cohorts here. What, what might make a lot of sense is to create a separation in time between the security guarantees and the protection of civil society and the construction of an end game, maybe three, four, or five years, with a sunset provision that allows, that puts pressure on all parties to come to a conclusion. But when you try to eliminate the violence at the same time to find an end game, it might be an experience that it might be a frustrating. So experience. one possibility would be, and just correct me if I'm getting this wrong, disengage. Right. Let people sort of stay in place and deal with their own issues for a while have that be the basis of a kind of a power sharing and then plan a transition three, four, five years down the road? Is that there's, Yes, there's, there's a, an empowering, the, the lack of violence empowers civil society. So over time, the reduction of violence creates a different ability to see an end game than it would right from this moment. Okay, I'll come to you in a second. What about? So you, the question you posed to us was can't afford and the question then becomes, uh, can't afford compared to what? Um, the experts uh, around the table in the rooms, 60% think this is headed towards a fragmented country. Um, in those circumstances, if you're an American policymaker, uh, how do you come to grips with that particular challenge? Uh, do you think? Do we think, after our Iraq example, our Afghan example, that we can uh, we can make a significant difference? Uh, where we may conclude, not yet, but in time, is that this becomes an issue less of governance and more of threat, as the as the jihadist threat grows in the north and in the east. At that point we may redefine our interests in, the, in Syria away from the issue of governance and in response to a threat that we th then think uh, has direct implications but, for us. But that inquires, requires an uh, elapsed time between now and for some sure. point in the future. For right? sure. Um, I think one of the things that drives everything in what we're talking about here is that all of the actors around this table, all, none of them seem to think that there's sufficient urgency to do anything really strong now. They all think, well, we've lived with this thus far, you know, Russia or Iran or the United States or the Europeans are kind of like, well, you know, we'd like to see a good outcome. We're happy to have peace talks, but we don't want to put troops on the ground. We don't want to spend a lot of money. We don't want to run a big high degree of political risk. Um, and at the same time, there seems to be a perception from those close to the conflict that without that kind of pressure, you're not going to get the, the conflict resolved, which is why you end up with, I think, 60% of the people saying fragmentation and that the, the peace talks aren't going to go anywhere and that this is unlikely because there is no political will absent a real urgent um, threat. George. Well, a couple, of, I was going to start where where we were before with the Zimbabwe non-analogy, because it is not an analogy, because what you're dealing with in Syria is a fiercely dedicated armed opposition, fragmented opposition, and that's far from what you've got in Zimbabwe, so that model doesn't apply, example doesn't apply at all. And the, the problem with the scenario of um, a fragmented sol solution is it's not a solution to the extent that Mona's folks up here are not party to it. And if they're not participating in it, then you do not have a viable governing structure, even if a decentralized one, that uh, is stable over some period of time. More so because the folks, some of the folks who are going to be occupying stre uh, large stretches of territory are people um, that we don't want to see uh, having a hold 
and a, an ability to operate from that territory. Why were we in Afghanistan? At least what, the, what was the rationale? Rationale was to prevent certain terrorist um, elements from, from establishing themselves in Afghanistan. Well, we're, you're not going to allow that in, to happen in, uh, in Syria either. So it's not, the, the problem I see with this um, fragmented sort of decentralized system is that it would be fine if all of the elements in that system were dedicated to the proposition that they, they want this to work as a stable political solution, but, 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 but not all of them are. But, but wait a second, I, I just, I, I don't mean to challenge the, the you yeah. know, the, the, all of it, but just with this one question, we were in Afghanistan so that you couldn't have that kind of uh, uh, terrorist force there. But we are leaving Afghanistan, and we are seemingly willing to undertake the risk that that kind of a force grows there. There are more terrorists on the ground in Iraq right now um, than there were in Afghanistan when we went into Iraq or when we went into Afghanistan. In terms, so we seem to be willing to accept this in in big places where we have much bigger investments than here. Yeah, or we seem to be willing to fool ourselves into thinking that we've solved a problem that we, in fact, have not solved. <laughs> well, that's... Um, and could we be equally willing to uh, to play that kind of a charade in Syria by saying we're going to in the in we're going to acknowledge up front that we're creating a situation which is indeed um, as volatile, if not more volatile, than what we're uh, okay. But, but Karen, uh, you, you have a comment, and I, I'd like you to make whatever the comment is, but I want to ask you a question, or you and your colleagues a question here. In terms of the Saudis and the moderate states looking at this, it looks like this is going off the tracks to me. You know, It looks like what, we, what you're ending up with here is protracted, divided country, some pockets of stability, some pockets of instability, um, some of the forces that are most concerning to um, uh, Saudi and moderate Arab regimes, both in terms of the Assad-Iranian connection and in terms of the Islamist extremist connection, allowed to continue to flourish in here. And the rest of the international community, despite all the checks you may wish to write, sort of saying, OK, well, this is your problem in the region. And I'd just I'd be yeah, interested. That, that's basically the point I wanted to oh, make. I'm, that I'm sorry. I, everyone else can say their piece. but. I think even from a Saudi point of view, as I tried to say earlier, we, the ruling Al Saud family, have even bigger issues than Syria. Not that we don't care about Syria, but we have even bigger issues, namely our generational leadership transition, the fact that we're not a monolith and we don't really tend to do much in the region except pass out money unless the Americans tell us what to do. And the Americans have no earthly idea what to do um, and don't really want to get involved. So I think from the point you were picking up on earlier, everybody's point of view, uh, the critical actors, there's simply not enough urgency now. Things are going to have to get worse. We can all fear and talk about what might happen, but until it happens, it's harder to give up and make concessions than it is to wait and hope. So I don't think, uh, I don't think there's much uh, appetite for the Americans, who I still think do remain important, to do anything, and therefore we don't really uh, know what to do other than pass out money to everybody. I, I think there's one thing you can say about the South is they know how to set priorities. And Syria is outside the red line. And it would be nice to win, and we don't want Iran to win, and we don't want this. But at the end of the day, there are things you can do, and there are things you can't do anything about. God's will. As long as that trouble, the troubles there don't cross the red line, as in Bahrain, Iran, Kenny, Bahrain, uh -huh. as long as it doesn't cross into, into our direct territory, we can find a way to live with the messy situation as long as it stays in Syria. Okay, Jim. Very quickly, let me caveat my rather discouraging last comment. Uh, We've gone into other 
horrifically violent places before, Kosovo, Bosnia, even the Sinai, with troops, we still have a battalion there today. Uh, and it's worked in a way that clearly didn't work or hasn't worked in Afghanistan, Iraq, and years back, Vietnam. And I think the main difference isn't the horrific violence that was present in all these places. It's that there were outside actors who both had both the intention and the capability of contesting our presence in those latter three places, whereas with Bosnia, with uh, Kosovo, with uh, the Sinai, all of the regional actors in the international community essentially supported that presence, and that dried up the support to those who wanted to challenge our in the international presence. So if you could get some kind of international agreement where everybody, including the uh, regional jihadist support network, to uh, either support or to be shut down, then a international presence, including even an American international presence, uh, would be conceivable, and one could imagine that it would not have to encounter years of heavy fighting. Hans. As I um, look at the uh, map of Syria today, it reminds me of Bosnia uh, in the early 90s. And uh, Bosnia today is a divided nation. Uh, it has the, the, the fiction there that it is a unified state, but it's, it's basically two states. Um, so how did, and that's not a bad solution compared to where we are today in Syria. So, you know, is it possible to follow the Bosnia model here? And what did it take? I mean, it took Srebrenica uh, to get uh, people motivated. Uh, we thought we might have a Srebrenica moment with the use of chemical weapons. That was obviously not enough, given the fatigue we have in the United States and in Europe. Uh, but if things continue, that Trevor needs a moment still may come. So if it does, when, if, if we can get attention, what is it that you need to do to sort of follow that uh, Bosnia model? You do need some intervention. Uh, you need a vision. Uh, you need um, a Dayton. You may need a Dick Holbrook. Uh, there's, going to be, there's going to be population movement. Uh, so that this checkerboard starts looking more like uh, what Bosnia might look like that looks like today. And you're going to need some follow-on force. Now, here in Europe, we happen uh, to be busy with uh, well, that's, that's what Mali I was gonna, and... Uh, well, but I, that's what I was going to get so at. We're, I, I think we well, do I'd need like the Americans to speak on behalf of here. Europe. Yeah, okay. That's, yeah. I'm just laying out a vision for what might be. This is the European this vision? Is, no, the, this is a, a vision that I think uh, the United States might consider yeah, well, I understand. leading in. They would provide some assistance. Yeah, I, yeah, this is the European vision I'm used to, um, which is where we believe that we need intervention. This is a critical issue of moral imperative to the world, and the United States should do it because we're busy. Well, you forgot the, the fact that in Bosnia they had largely uh, beaten themselves uh, into a point where neither of the three parties thought they could win and so they were resigned to spending a lot of time with Richard Holbrook. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, if, we, if we are looking at an intervention force to keep a peace, that's a lot more possible than uh, as we've talked about occasionally, a force to enforce a peace. Um, I, I just don't see politically that's something that the United States is going to be prepared to do absent a consensus in the region. I mean, remember, Libya has set a very high bar for American intervention, including a UN Security Council resolution, including an Arab League invitation, and including not just the United States, but partners. Um, from Europe. So um, none of those conditions have existed in Syria. And I think the consensus of the group is they're not likely to uh, exist anytime soon. Well, I mean, here, you know, you talk about a Srebrenica moment. There are 120,000 people dead. Chemical weapons have been used 14 times. Um, you know, w w what does it take? You know, um, you know, ha you know the, the half the country is dislocated. Uh, I, I think what we've established in Syria is, you know, short of, you know, a blonde American college co-ed being killed there, the United States is not going to care about it. 
Um, you know, and you forgive me for being so glib, but the reality is we, you know, we are like tuned out. Um, but it's relevant to the overall discussion because if no one is willing to go in and keep a peace, and by the way, even if we have a unitary government, even if we have a government for the whole state, we've still got Mona out there blowing up things and causing problems, and it needs to be stabilized by somebody. Um, and so that becomes another you know, issue in this conflict. So we've got a few more people now ready to jump in. Please, I encourage you to jump in in your roles here uh, in terms of how do we tackle this issue of stabilizing this situation, um, which right now looks to me like a fragmented state. But how do we stabilize it, Rhonda? I'm not going to step into my role here, but I hate to bring this example because it's not that shiny example, which is how the Lebanon civil war was ended in 1989. And it took the Saudis, the Egyptians, and the Syrians, and the power of the Syrian government at the time, to force the Lebanese parties to come together and come to some kind of a power sharing agreement or a revised power sharing agreement to what existed before, and it was later enforced by the Syrians. But it was a regional affair. And I think here there is too much emphasis, and it's clear from hearing the international parties that the international groups are not par countries I mean parties are not interested they are not going they are not going to go into the conflict now so maybe the emphasis should be on the regional access and here I'm talking about four main countries that if a peace is going to be uh, introduced in Syria are critical to that making it happen Qatar Saudi Arabia Iran and Turkey and is there a common interest, a basic common interest, on which we can start to build common ground among these four regional powers about achieving peace in Syria? For example, is there a common interest in preserving the territorial integrity of Syria and not uh, leading uh, and not not ha not introducing some kind of uh, changes or minor what, changes to is the. Is that a rhetorical question? Yeah, I mean, is there an interest among these four regional powers today and in the short term well, let, to let's, have? Let's 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 address that question, Ken. Let me let me turn it to you. It, it, it seems to me there may be a common interest among those parties, but it wouldn't be to maintain territorial integrity. It'd be to maintain as much of Syria as they could maintain, and that you know Iran would say, okay, fine. Let's just draw the lines. And you know, part of what, Andrew, you were getting at was, it seems like people are anticipating that lines are going to be drawn. And they're sort of moving into position and sort of say, and there is, you know, you talk about outside people being involved. Well, the Russians and the Iranians will be very happy to defend the parts of Syria that will protect their interests, so, you know, or keep writing checks or doing what they need to do. Is that a, correct in your view, or is it? Yeah, and just as my hat is the Iranian, something Dan and I talked about earlier was, I think for the Iranians, a second best outcome would be a situation where there is a very uh, well-protected Alawi enclave uh, controlling mostly the territory that they have now. Now, from the Iranian perspective, that could expand. It certainly couldn't contract, but they'd be glad to have it expand over time. Uh, but that might be a basis for some kind of a comparison. But if I could, David, I just wanted to make a couple of quick other alternative points as well, based on things that people have raised. PJ's right, and we always forget about this. In Bosnia, what made Dayton possible was the fact that we built a Croat army that beat the crap out of the Bosnians. Out of, the, out of the Serbs, excuse me, and the Bosniaks as well. And, you know, it's a critical pre precondition. It goes back to a point that was made by a gentleman behind me earlier, that the military balance is absolutely critical to this. And another one, Rhonda's nice point about Lebanon, where, yes, at the end of the day, what really solves things is the Syrian army going in and cracking heads in 1990 and taking down Michelle out, which also raises a possible outcome in this, which is if another regional power, perhaps Turkey, were willing to play Syria's role, that would be another way to do it. Okay. Does Turkey have any appetite to play that role, do you think? Turkey will not play that role by itself. I mean, Turkey will, is still in the mood of being a, a free rider. It wants the United States and the Westerners to do it. Uh, but is it, what I remind the Turks very often is that in 19... Um, it was in 2003 when we were getting ready to invade Iraq. The president, then foreign minister of Turkey, said, "Iraq, it's a regional problem. Why are the United States coming and dealing with Iraq? We should deal with Iraq." 
Well, maybe this time has come for the United States and the Western allies to turn the, the, the table around and say, this is a regional problem, it's going to affect you, you deal with it. Yeah, and the U.S. may do that intentionally think, or unintentionally. But that eventually, I mean, the, the worsening situation in terms of both refugees, instability, etc., I think is going to force the regional countries. The four that were mentioned, but I would also add Iraq there, because Iraq is the one that is most, most, most threatened, maybe dysfunctional at the moment, but it is, it is an important actor. Without Iraq involved, you can't get things okay. done. Okay, what is the Russian perspective on this, you know, evolving situation here? And then I want to come back to you guys. You know, I think that the Russians would be extremely unhappy to see the fragmentation of Syria, uh, that, that Russia fears fragmentation within its own borders, and to see yet another precedent, I guess, uh, yet another example of this taking place, it, it just wouldn't be, be happy at all. So I think that they, one of their reasons for supporting the Assad regime, supporting the Syrian security services, is to prevent this. But if we have something such as, for example, a you know, jihadist Syria in the interior and an Alawite enclave on the coast, then I think that obviously they have an interest in, in protecting the Alawite enclave, uh, enclave, partly because you know of the naval facility, but also I have a feeling that we would then see Russia moving aggressively to reconcile this Alawite rump state with Israel. There was that that basically for, you know, as, as Lavrov himself said recently, you know, the, the main enemy for Russia is in general are Sunni jihadists and to unite you know, everyone who they doesn't care they don't care they don't like each other, but everyone who has an interest in working against those people should work together basically. Brokering that Yes. Elusive Israeli-Iranian uh, partnership that everybody's looking for. You know, it's. <laughs> it, 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 I wouldn't rule that out. Um, well, but so let me ask you one question. It's uh, it's rhetorical, but I, I think we need to say it in the context of this whole thing. Russia doesn't want to see broken up Syria. Is the fear of a broken up Syria enough to get Russia to want to, you know? get rid of Assad and, you know, play the sort of heavy-handed role to try to produce a, a, a political transition that might keep the state together? I think the fear of a broken up Syria is an argument what Russia would use to convince, try to persuade everyone else that you cannot afford to do without Assad, that after Assad, you have chaos. Therefore, he is the key, whether you like him or not, he is the key to any kind of stability. Can the U.S. ever accept that position? I think you'd have to um, create a kind of a Sudan-like um, environment where, where, or, or a Palestinian-like environment where the Bush administration invented the prime minister's position to um, marginalize a, a president. But if Assad is still calling the shots, that would be very difficult for the United States. Can Saudi Arabia ever accept that position? Of uh, Assad? of Assad as the answer, of keeping Assad in place? It would be very hard for them, I think. Not impossible. I think they will kiss and make up with the Iranians here, and but it would be a little difficult having put so much into getting rid of them. T yeah. Depends on the terms. Tur yeah, it depends on the okay. terms. Jeremy. Uh, look, from a Turkish position, um, it's not a question, can we accept it? It's the question that the premise is false, that, um, the, that the idea that Assad is the key to stability is exactly 180 degrees wrong. It is, in fact, that Assad is the problem uh, and that he's, his very presence guarantees that there will not be stability, in part based on the rather spectacular war crimes that he has committed, which has delegitimized him in the eyes of his own people and in the eyes of the international community, uh, but also because of the regime that he's been running, and he and his father have been running for 40 years, which has depended on, uh, on the, a degree of oppression which is simply incompatible with where Syria is. So it's not, it's not about Turkey or any other country deciding whether that's acceptable. It's about, the, it's about the fact that he is not compatible with stability. Okay. So, listening to all of this, I'm back in a fragmented state. This is what you guys have left, is a rump state, rump Alawite state. Um, 
I mean, is that what you're hearing here as well? Oh, it, it does not have to be necessarily fragmented. And here, this is uh, the Assad regime speaking. The solution is very, very simple and very clear. Uh, stop the American, Zionist, Turkish, Saudi, Qatari conspiracy uh, against Syria by stopping to um, equip them with uh, weapons. Look the other way when the Syrian army uh, creates massacres. And in the end, uh, there will be stability in Syria without any fragmentation. This is point A. This is the Assad regime. If I could uh, have a point B to counter-argue myself. Um, yeah, well, I found the first part completely unconvincing. So try to, to try me. But I have to say this, because I, I heard Rhodesia or, or Zimbabwe, and I heard South Africa, and I heard Ireland, and I heard Bosnia. I returned not too long ago from uh, Bosnia. I was in Sarajevo, and most people I spoke to told me they didn't like Ambassador Holbrook very much. They hated Dayton. They hated the division. And this was, in fact, uh, uh, not their solution. Uh, and I look around in this room. We voted 60 percent that it is likely that Syria would be fragmented. But I bet you out of the four or five Syrians among us here, I bet you anything that we would vote counter this fragmentation. Um, uh, there is an urgency about the situation. And I agree with Karina. It is a function of time. The longer the conflict goes on, the more like Somalia is going to look and the more fragmented it's going to be. And the danger is it's going to spill over into the rest of the region. So it is an urgent situation. Uh, I do believe that a national government, a national unity government, can come out of this without Assad. Uh, and uh, we, really have to, uh, we really have to calculate the effect of the absence of the Assad regime on a national unity government. And I, could, I think that would be a very positive effect, bring in civil society. Uh, and a Syria that is not fragmented and that has a decentralized system. And I want oh. to second uh, uh, Randa Slim on what she said about Lebanon. Look, Lebanon is very, it has a very fragmented society, but at the end of the day, it was saved by Taif. And Lebanon, weak or not, and believe it or not, is one of the more stable Arab <laughs> regimes. So I am hoping that Syria would look something like Lebanon in the future, rather than having it fragmented, or rather than having Syrians lament as the Bosnians are lamenting now. Okay. Now, that was, uh, that was a very articulate, thoughtful, and compelling argument. It was totally against the rules of this, OK? Because it was essentially saying, I would like to set aside everything we've established so far uh, and tell you how I'd like to see it. But we can't get to some of those things based on the way this conversation has gone. And I just want to note that while respecting the articulate comment. Yes? I suspect that Assad believes that if, there were, if he were truly willing to have a, a free and fair election in Syria, I mean all of Syria, that he might well win it if, there was, if he was up against one candidate put up by the opposition. Because, you know, if you look at that chart that was up there, okay, 59% of the population is Sunni Arab, and let's speak in generalities. There are Sunnis who, as much as they hate Assad, and they do, think he's the lesser of the two evils. So he, will, he would get most of the minority votes, and he would carry a certain number of urban Sunnis. Well, th theoretically, he would actually do better if he were up against five different people, too, right? Yeah, but anyway, the fact is he can never govern. We know he can never govern all the Syrians, all of Syria again, with anything other than an incredible iron fist, and he doesn't have the resources to do that anymore. Uh, but we have to recognize that he, he has a following. He has a group of people who believe that absent him, the regime falls apart and they will fall prey to, to uh, the worst of the jihadists. Okay, very quickly, because I want to move on to another point. Qu quickly, though, yes. After conferring with, um, with, with, with my colleague, um, we'd like to second uh, our Turkish uh, counterpart's um, point. The Assad regime is not only brutal and at the very heart of instability in this matter and the way it's tried to shoot its way out of the crisis, it also has a proven track record of being inelastic. It can't reform. It never has, even under the best of times. So perhaps uh, we have put forward, and let me see if I get this right, General, um, that more opportunities go going forward are between um, moderate members of the FSA and the SMC 
um, coming together with vetted members of the um, of some of the security services in the army around the uh, around the regime, that that perhaps might be a viable formula for putting the pieces back together in the future. Okay, calm. Touch the, bu the button. Um, just a, a tiny bit about the international force. I mean, it seems to me that I mean the UN. You know, there's already kind of. Um, um, uh, war games or peacekeeping games going on about what sort of role a peacekeeping, um, you know, force would serve, and it's basically the idea of kind of informally, I think, reinforcing a kind of a de facto partition, providing protection for the Alawi for other minority groups. Um, the notion that you know you could turn this into an enforcement operation. I mean, the the only um, possibility. I could think where you could get agreement on an enforcement mechanism would be solely if it were directed at the more extremist jihadist elements, and it would put the UN in a, in, and, and the West in a particularly awkward position of, of sort of in some ways indirectly reinforcing this tendency towards um, President Assad or the Assad regime, if he is not in power, as essentially you know being his international army. I mean, at this point, it doesn't seem that there's much prospect for the armed opposition to play, um, to have much of a, of a role if they're not in some way supported with outside support. I mean, the Bosnia example, um, you know, sort of uh, increasing uh, the Bosniaks and, and the Croatians' military capacity to challenge the Serbians kind of brought them to the table. It doesn't seem like there's anything like that in place to strengthen the position. Okay, if somebody would like to make a compelling argument oh. after I go to these next three people quickly, that there is actually some international force that somebody would offer, I would, be, I would love to hear that. I hear a lot of people saying you need to have an international force, but I don't see anybody willing to actually field an international force. We're, we're uh, quite ready. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's extremely constructive, and Ken is smiling. He's absolutely delighted that you've worked <laughs> That you've worked that out, and and oh, and Syrian civil society, oh, but but I you know I do think you know un, underneath this uh, uh, jollity here, the 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 reality is that the, the it just in question after question after question here, the chips are on the Assad, on the side of Assad, the Iranians, the Russians, in that perspective, because they're committed and it's existential for them. And, and, and the other side, it's not. And, you know, we can talk around this all that we want, but it seems to be something uh, uh, that, that is coloring every dimension of this. However, as Syrian civil society, you may have a different perspective. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the question um, that was going around the room, particularly to the bilateral and to the government agencies, is if we remove Assad or keep Assad, is this something that you would accept? And acknowledging that we are helpless and acknowledging that we are voiceless and we are not decision makers as civil society, I think that it's very important to remember that it's actually Syrian civil society that will be implementing whatever's made in these back rooms, in these corners. And so really the question of is Assad acceptable or not should be geared at Syrian civil society? Are they willing to negotiate? And as time prolongs, as the issues of transitional justice and revenge become more essential, the more families who are victims both of the rebels and of the um, Assad regime, that question becomes harder and harder to answer. But again, I think that but we what, can have... But what leverage do you have? Well, we're the ones who are going to implement. So you can make all the agreements, but it's pen on paper. It's the Syrian civil society. It's the individuals on the street. It's the people who are picking up arms who will decide whether whatever you but, agree but, on but, is but realistic. But what if the best possible piece well, is a That phrase in itself really bothers Syrian well, civil society. Uh, yeah, well, okay. But, you know, as we say in the West, tough luck. Yeah. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of the best possible piece that we have here, it looks like, you know, we've got a kind of rump, uh, a, you know, regime Assad regime, and then there may be some pockets of semi-functioning Syrian civil society. Um, there may be a little Kurdish pocket, and then everybody else has got Mona wandering around saying, you know, you know, don't 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 park your car there, um, because, um, <laughs> you know, it's, and 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 so. But I mean, you know, in in that kind of situation, the traction you're going to have is in your enclaves that are not controlled by her or by him, right? 
Or it's in the decision or voting in terms of who you actually support. So as you begin to support Mona or other groups, it's basically the decisions that you're making at this table where civil society will say, actually, we're going to give all efforts to support Mona's position. Or we're So the more realistic the agreements are, the more likely beyond those who fall, you know, the civil society will actually make a decision where to throw it. And civil society, I'm not talking about NGOs, I'm not talking about humanitarian, I'm basically talking about the citizens on the ground, which is very diverse, encompasses the religious groups, encompasses the extreme encompasses everyone. So those decisions and what you do, again, in closed doors, will determine your legitimacy as a political power. True, and I don't want to be I don't want to be argumentative on this point, but I do want to underscore the point that as we look around the Arab uprisings of the course of the past um, uh, couple of years, there have been a lot of activity on the part of civil society at the beginning of them, but because they weren't organized and there was no leadership. It, it ends up not having a lot of political resonance. And that's why I think the point that my colleague Peter made is so essential, is that you need to build in the time for the end game where you're actually allowing a process for civil society to participate. Okay, now, because we can't cover everything, but I do want to move this forward within the context of the session, I'm going to address one more issue here in the stabilization and structure issue, and then I want to jump ahead a little bit to some issues that may seem a little bit optimistic which is uh, a couple of economic questions uh, um, and uh, humanitarian questions before we get out of this session. But, you know, we, there's a lot of discussion here about international peacekeepers, but so far, even though you represent international peacekeepers, nobody's offering you peacekeepers or money or support or anything. And I just, you know, I mean, it, 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 it... That wouldn't be unprecedented now, would it? <laughs> no, <it's... laughs> Yeah. And yet. But, but you, so, so what I'm saying is you seem to be a figment of the collective imagination. <laughs> uh, and yet peacekeepers are being, I mean, peacekeepers, there are 15 UN peacekeeping operations as we speak right now. So they, they are all over the place, even if, even if not many countries are willing to donate. It depends on what they're going to do. And you have a good quote from um, uh, the former Indian representative to the UN about what peace, what you're asking peacekeepers to do. And we, we talked about the difference between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. I'd just like to jump forward. I, I don't know that the solution to Syria is contingent on peace enforcement. It probably is not. It probably, this, you know, you, we have as our mandate to talk about a UN peace, robust peace enforcement mission. That's probably not what we're talking about in this case because of Russia. Right, because because we do actually have a veto <laughs> on this matter. It's not just a spoiler issue. It's it's an actual veto. So, so we're talking about Chapter Six. We're not talking about Chapter Seven. We're talking about more of a classical yet multidimensional peacekeeping operation along the lines of what we had in Cambodia. And remember, in Cambodia, it wasn't the 200,000 Vietnamese that defeated the Khmer Rouge. It was an election. It was a UN peacekeeping operation that didn't use force, that only had diplomacy to work with, and it took the wind out of the Khmer Rouge. They didn't have any political basis, to, they didn't have any legs to stand on anymore. Anyway, so it, it's, ha it's not like it's unprecedented that you have that kind of a scenario. It sounds a little rosy, but it has happened before. Just one word of caution and then I'll end. We started this session talking about pillars. Mm -hmm. And one thing that has not worked very well in these complex UN missions is the pillar approach. NATO, you'll be in charge of security. The EU, why don't you be in charge of reconstruction? Somebody else will do disarmament. The World Bank can do um, development assistance. And when you have pillars, you have stovepipes. No one wants to be coordinated by anyone else. And, and I, I, you deal with this all the time, right? It's really, the pillar approach has been very problematic. It doesn't work. You need a benevolent dictator, which is what Sergio Vera de Mello was in East Timor, for example. I mean, you need somebody who is in charge of the operation, who is all of the different components of the international operation is answerable to that person, and then you have more or less functioning 
UN peacekeeping operations. And actually, Yasushi Akashi played that role in Cambodia also. It's, it's when you have one person who's answerable and one okay. organization. OK. I think in, 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 the, in defense of the pillar arguments at the beginning, you could just as easily have used the term components. Uh, we weren't arguing that you know there, that this should be approached as pillars, but that just there were multiple components to achieving peace. Sharon, I want to go to you, um, and and then what I want to do is I want to go and talk to some of the economic folks here about this situation and what degree of stabilization in either of these scenarios might start to lead towards some economic activity and some organic activity. And then I want to talk about what degree of stabilization might be seen as a potential trigger for any kind of international economic. Uh, you know, can, can you envision a situation where absence a you know, peace process, a peace agreement, and one government for one Syria, uh, money could be coming in to help stabilize different regions uh, of the country? Because at the end of the day, one way you win in one of these things is by defeating another army. And another way that you win one of these things conceivably is um, by you know, creating a little bit of growth and a little bit of activity and giving people some incentive to, to, you know, to build on an a, a, you know, a, a inchoate but developing status quo. Sharon. Yeah, no, thank you. That um, actually tracks very closely with some of the things that I wanted to say and uh, speaks to the economic issues as well. You know, uh, this this section really was, uh, it, it felt a lot more like we were in the political settlement section in some ways. Whether there is a power sharing arrangement, whether there is a fragmented state, one of the questions I'd really like us to grapple with a bit more, and maybe not around governance, but certainly around economic development and refugee return and resettlement, is you know assuming that one or the other holds and the international community is starting to flow assistance into these areas do we have the right models and i would argue that we probably don't if you look at the way we delivered governance assistance in afghanistan and iraq it clearly didn't work particularly well we picked one side of the conflict if you look at the way we develop economic uh, d uh, deliver economic assistance globally there is a huge amount of evidence that straight up economic development assistance triggers violence it does not support stability and so as we think through these models, you know, I think we really need to ask ourselves some hard questions about, you know, are we doing governance the right way in these places by flowing so much of our assistance towards formal institutions, as opposed to the types of arrangements that Manal is talking about, where we certainly have seen in places like Iraq, we've put governance way at the grassroots level where we've brought together uh, government officials, tribal leaders, religious leaders, civil society groups, Sunni, Shia, Arab, Kurd, those groups at the civil society level have very successfully promoted good governance in smaller, discrete areas that begins to flow up. And quite frankly, I, I know people were a little skeptical of Moaz's point, these kinds of groups have dealt with extremists very successfully on their own. And so, again, I, I want us to start questioning our, our overall models. I don't think the way we've been doing it works. And I think that we, as a community, need to push a little bit further on how we change the way we do business in these places. So that would be my plea, not just for governance, but also when we look at economic development assistance. OK. Julianne. Um, Europe's feeling a little defensive. I uh, just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. All was um, the first time. Uh, <laughs> on the international peacekeeping force, so yes, um, Europe is still limping along and recovering from the Euro crisis. Yes, we have a war-weary public. Uh, deep skepticism about the ability for the West to reconstruct an entire country uh, and definitely looking forward to ending the mission in many ways in Afghanistan. But let me say that depending on the parameters of the agreement, I think you can count on European financial assistance, European presence of some kind, training police, institution building, some sort of civilian capacity. Not in huge numbers. We don't have thousands and thousands of troops to contribute to this, but I think it's not fair to say that Europe and the United States would necessarily sit it out. I think there are legitimate challenges, 
uh, with trying to construct some sort of either peace enforcement or peacekeeping. One could be easier than the other. But I think there is the potential for the West to contribute something significant, again, depending on the parameters. There's lots of different scenarios here. Secondly, in the category of being a bit defensive, I just want to defend our American partners. Um, David, you've been, you know, you've you've summarized kind of the American position of sitting this one out, you know, that turning a blind eye, not being particularly active. I think there were moments early on in the conflict where the United States wasn't particularly helpful or playing an active role. But now I think the game has changed. No, there's not a full-scale U.S. intervention in Syria of any kind. But the role that the U.S. is playing right now in negotiations is critical. The role that the U.S. is playing on the CW destruction while not resolving the conflict is also critical. The donations that the U.S. has provided along with Europe on humanitarian assistance are important. So I think we're being a little bit too simplistic. How in are, the those, view arms, of how are those arms shipments going? Right. Right. Okay. Right. I okay. can sit no, here sorry. and tell you all that we can be glib about this and, and say, okay, and not, not enough. We haven't worked a solution. 120,000 people dead. But it haunts Washington and it haunts Europe. And I think for us to sit here and continually make this assumption that the West is somehow just turning the other way and doesn't give a damn isn't exactly fair either. So that's no, all I wanted I, to and, and, I, and I agree with you. What, I, what I'm trying to do here, I'm, I'm not trying to be clipped what I'm trying although sometimes I can't help it but what, what I'm really trying to do here is to stress test some of the assumptions because of, you know periodically people say well we need to have a robust peacekeeping force or we need to you know put money into this thing or, or these states need to get together to support this transition and we have to stress test the idea because we're looking for the best possible peace we have to know whether it's possible or not now some of you guys here down are you know dealing with economic issues and there are a bunch of ways to deal with it, and others among you may have views on this as you represent states, because clearly if there's pockets of Saudi supporters someplace, they may get a little bit of economic assistance if we're in this kind of fragmented world. But is it possible to, there's an $80 billion price tag that's been put on this. Is it possible to imagine any kind of economic recovery taking place in this part of the world with any of these solutions that we've described that are kind of partial solutions? I mean, what's the trigger going to be? What is the private sector going to look for? What do you think the government trigger is going to be, Rob? Yeah, I think, uh, actually, the fact that there are as many disparate players uh, as there are in Syria yields itself to uh, a, a better way of rebuilding most uh, engagements we've had in the last few years, which is to do it at a community level. In other words, look at political subdivisions or groups or tribes uh, that uh, have some coherent uh, sense of, of uh, legacy in the community, create uh, decision-making processes about what should be repaired first and second, uh, have uh, access to resources once there is a sort of democratic consensus about it, and then uh, start the process of doing smaller projects, which in the aggregate can have an impact. I think to take it from the top-down approach, which we've taken in Iraq and we've taken in Afghanistan and we've taken so many other places, um, is frankly, it, it's ineffective in most cases. It, it lends the whole process to all the rent-seeking and all the dysfunction in central governments. Uh, and as a result, there is resentment that, that grows between central government and the local players because m money never gets to them and things don't get done. So uh, I actually think all this sort of disharmony or dysfunction among these many players yields itself to a more localized economic development initiatives. Are there are additional perspectives here. That said, Syria is a hard place to engage in physically. And so the Alawite uh, merchants on the coast, you could do something with that community, but it's very difficult to do anything with the Kurdish community. It's very difficult to do anything with the, the Sunnis who uh, are opposed to the government. So it's going to be very difficult to do any kind of economic development other than uh, right along the coast. You know, I sort of feel like this is, uh, just as we've been discussing on the political side, it's about a staged approach. It's a phased approach. The economic development is going to be, a redevelopment is going to be phased and staged. Um, it's very important to remember that, um, as Hernando de Soto said, talking about Egypt, 
um, what's been lost in the in the discussion about the Arab Spring in Egypt is that the people who were in the streets first were primarily jobless youth, of which there are more in the Arab world than any other region in the world. Um, in Syria, you have you know astronomical joblessness and particularly youth joblessness. So unless the the, the solution is seen to is seen to be including addressing that, you're probably going to not be satisfying a lot of the fundamental needs of of civil society. The other thing I, I just want to add is that we, we we started an interesting project here at USIP on the role of economic development in post-conflict and fragile states. And that work is at its very earliest days and, and I think has a long way to go. But there's a, a general recognition, um, and we did a case study about Rwanda as an example. Uh, Rwanda was probably one of the most desperate basket cases post-conflict of any, of any country in the world um, in 1994. And, uh, and for the last 10 years has had the greatest year-on-year -year per capita income growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and as I tell people, there's about to be a new W Hotel to be built there, which, which in my mind is sort of the pinnacle of economic development. Who'd have thunk it, right, 17 years ago? So I, I really do believe that there is um, a, an opportunity and a role yet to be completely devised for what the economic development piece is of the reconstruction. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, in a previous life in the Clinton administration, was involved in post-conflict economic intervention in a couple of places, and then after that, when I, I wrote a book at the Carnegie Endowment on this thing, and one of the punchlines after talking to a lot of people involved was, you can't build an economic house on a political sinkhole. Um, and But that doesn't mean that you need to have a broad political solution, you, you can have pockets of stability that produce some pockets of growth. But the other mistake that gets made very often in this is that you then call upon parts of the United States government that, or, or European or other governments that have a responsibility for uh, economic development in the traditional sense to do post-conflict intervention. And it's just a completely different set of needs because the post-conflict economic intervention has to have a political outcome as opposed to simply a long-term economic outcome. And, you know, we, we literally, I mean, this is one of the things the United States has been doing the longest uh, in the post-war era, you know, going in and intervening post-conflict reconstruction and stuff. And we still don't have the institutions to do it. We, st we still, you know, every time this happens, we say we don't have the institutions. We still don't have the institutions to do it. Did Turkey wish to say something here on the economic front, since you have a big uh, yeah, border here? we did. Um, look, I think that uh, Turkey can agree with all of the points that were made about the problems of a top-down approach and agree that there is some that there are some benefits to be had from working with uh, local actors. But at the same time, I think that we see some serious dangers in that approach, too, in particular that the, uh, that it, if it's not done well and if it's not done correctly, it can empower the wrong types of actors and it can threaten the unity of Syria, which I think is very important for the region. So it would be Turkey's view that it would be, particularly if Western, Euro US and European governments are gonna take this approach, that it would be very important for them to work through the neighbors, particularly through Turkey, uh, to help them to identify who are the correct local actors to support. Uh, and I think that Turkey would uh, insist upon that if it was going through uh, Turkish territory, which it, of course, would. Um, so I think that if, if, you, if uh, Western actors in particular are thinking about this approach, keep in mind that it's going to have to be coordinated with Turkey and that Turkey is going to have some very strong views on who the appropriate actors are in the interests of maintaining the unity of Syria and maintaining uh, the appropriate actors and that we don't actually have faith in the West to be able to correctly identify the appropriate actors. Do you want to add something, Mona? Yes. Uh, not only are we thrilled that we have our emirate established now in some fragmented portion of Syria, but we also profit. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. 
We also are profiting from a war economy. Um, we, there are smuggling networks, there are all kinds of criminal activities that we are deriving and sustaining our, our emirate off of and others. So beyond the clear benefit of attempting to get down to the local level, et cetera, there are many vested interests in perpetuating essentially a war profiteering economy, and you're going to have to fight very hard to roll those interests back. But that's also a bit of a two-way street, isn't it? I, and I, I mean that to your advantage, which is to say you're able to do that, generate capital, generate financial resources, and use it to pay off and buy local support and show yourself to be um, um, you know, economically invested in the communities in which you are um, doing your work, right? Absolutely. We, we can exploit all of this to great benefit. And it's going to be very difficult to unseat. In other words, the issues aren't just political and security. They're also economic interests that are deeply vested that you will have to work very hard to, um, to dismantle. OK. Look, we, we've gone through a, a bunch of stuff here. We, again, much as we did in the first session, we haven't covered every you know, conceivable dimension of this. Um, uh, but we, you know, I, I, I think are coming clearer and clearer to a picture, if not what the the best possible you know, piece looks like, perhaps several different possible pieces. Um, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of the time here talking about a fragmented state and you know, what that might mean and why we might have arrived there. And you know, we, we, I don't think we've solved the problem of peacekeeping. I think we have sort of developed a sense that it's going to have to be a more regional solution than, than some of these past solutions have been. Um, and that uh, it may need to be a more decentralized kind of an approach uh, if, in fact, we don't have a strong central government or we can't get there. There's one thing that I would like to say as a caveat on this whole process, though, before we take the break and, 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 come, and, and also before we get the comments here. But that is, in the course of this discussion, naturally all discussions have their kind of ebb and flow. And we've sort of had an ebb and flow uh, in the direction of fragmented and so forth. Um, but we shouldn't rule out altogether that, you know, impasses are broken from time to time. That sometimes you, you may not pull the royal flush, but you, you do get a couple of the elements. And you can actually get a political process going. And that can result in peacekeeping forces and money and some movement in that direction. And so even though we're having a conversation that has sort of drifted away from that, I want to underscore that we talked about that, that that's got to be sort of part of our calculus as we're looking at, at, at this in the context of this discussion in retrospect and also the one that we do next. That, you know, we, 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 will, we want to fill out a couple of scenarios in doing this. Do you want to provide us with your perspectives here? And then I want to take 30 seconds more to talk about the remainder of the day. Yes, David, and I concede that the expert council has had some temporary defections, but I'd like to assure you that we're left with a highly capable, highly legitimate and unified rump uh, council of experts that's in full control of our territory. Um, yeah. So rest assured. Um, well, give, I, us, give us some rump wisdom then. All <laughs> right, rump wisdom it is, um, headed by women, Paula points out. Uh, I wanted to point out two challenges I'm hearing, and then also two things that I would term, in, in the words of that great philosopher, Homer Simpson Christatunities. Uh, so the challenges. I first, thought that was Rahm Emanuel, but go on. Homer Simpson was there first. Yeah. Um, the first issue is this one of ripeness. And, you know, it wasn't phrased this way in the discussion today. It was framed more in terms of a lack of will or a lack of urgency. Our colleague, Pamela Allen, one of the six papers our USIP experts published for today, called it ripeness. One question that arises is, is if, there is a, if the conflict isn't ripe now, after more than 100,000 killed, almost half the population displaced, use of chemical weapons, what needs to happen for this conflict to be ripe? Uh, so I challenge the group, uh, you know, when I look at a green banana, I can make it a whole lot riper, a whole lot faster if I get a paper bag. Uh, what, is the, what, is the, what are the things or the components or the elements that would make this conflict ripen faster? Uh, because not ripening is, is not tolerable to any of us. 
Um, I also hear a repeated need for, for force, uh, potentially. Whether we are talking about protecting civilians or whether we are talking about imposing or uh, enforcing a political agreement or ensuring security to the Alawi community, uh, we are going to need some security guarantees. And although at least raised the tantalizing possibility that this could happen without the use of force, uh, my first instinct was that it's more like uh, the police talking before a drug bust. Someone's going to have to go in heavy. And, and so I think the question is, who is that uh, group or, or uh, of actors going to be? Um, turning to the crisis opportunities, one of the concerns raised was about the costs of fragmentation. But if we flip that around, I think one of the promises we heard was decentralization, which is a nicer way of saying fragmentation. And that there is a possibility of some kind of go decentralized governance that could be enforced. Uh, so that's crisis opportunity number one. Uh, crisis opportunity number two is we've heard a lot uh, in the analysis beforehand. Rachel Brandenburg wrote a great paper on the, the regional actors role in all of this, and, and certainly in the press, we've heard a lot about regional meddling. Well, what we heard today is also the possibility of regional intervention, which is a nice way of saying regional meddling, and the possibility that maybe the regional actors could come together and be the ones to provide a solution or, or some form of a solution in, in Syria the way they have in Lebanon. Uh, and last, we've heard an awful lot about weak institutions and all the, the problems that that brings with it. Uh, but I think what we also heard from Sharon today was the prospect that informal governance, which is a nicer way of saying weak institutions, uh, could also help to fill some of the gap at the local level and that that, that could be helping to provide some stability and security. Thanks. I came out with some of the same points as Kristen, so I'll start with the first one. Kaz, you were the one who mentioned, well, the threat, when it really is a threat versus, you know, managing governance and governance issues. I have to agree with uh, Kristen in the question of, if this isn't a threat in all of the different lanes that we're discussing, I don't know what it is. Uh, just taking the humanitarian side in of itself, it's destabilization uh, that it has on other countries, etc. Secondly is on the military, same point I put down. Uh, Ken mentioned military balance matters. There have been a number of you that have really uh, underscored the importance of the military in this component. So, but yet when David forced the issue about commitment, I don't think anyone stepped forward at all uh, uh, in that area. So it's- Julian, Julian offered some, she offered some trips. All right, thank you, all right. She volunteered, <laughs> she volunteered right. the Americans. Um, yes. I, I, I thought that this whole issue of political will permeated this conversation in so many different ways, um, in different shapes and forms, and the different uh, pieces of the conversation. Fourthly, I, I wanted to underscore the comment that was made down the line here about governance and not having the best models of governance. And then we had a discussion about top down versus bottom up. But quite frankly, my own view is I think the best is a combination. I, I didn't quite hear, maybe, maybe, maybe there were some that were thinking along those lines, because there were some cautionary notes um, made about uh, the local communities, the corrupt actions, but yet on the other hand, it seemed that there was some movement towards the importance of engagement of the local communities. And finally, I can't help but go back to an analogy a number of us had by different issues we've been involved in, Having been involved with Northern Ireland, something that really jumped out at me in this conversation is actually the importance of non-state actors. And I didn't quite hear it defined as such. What do I mean? I was very struck in the case with Northern Ireland that they, they Sinn Féin and the UDF, went out itself to confer with South Africa, with Colombia, to get ideas about how to bring about change. In other words, they themselves took the initiative in this case. And again, you can't make precise analogies here, but why do I mention it? They also later shared, when actually the devolution of power came to Northern Ireland, they actually shared the role that they were playing together going to Iraq 
maybe for better, for worse, but they were in Iraq and they were actually sharing their experience. So I wanted to inject that because I actually never really heard anyone reference the role of some non-state actors in this and what uh, some of the parties could potentially do when they feel that they don't have other alternatives and they're not working. So then they want to actually shape the piece rather than be on the outside of it. Thank you. And with that, by the way, that is a patch of blue sky up there. Um, that's it for the next week, by the way. I just wanted to point it out because I don't, I don't think you're going to see, see much more of that. Um, we're we're going to take a break now, but I, I want to put this in a little bit of perspective. The next section of this, the final session from today, is going to look at the things that could flare up, that could really take this off track in a serious way. We've talked about them a lot. But the question is, could these things happen in a way that makes things much worse, really stops these processes? Um, what is it that really puts this longer-term process at risk? Uh, then we're going to end, and we will end either on time or early. I promise you that, because we're committed to that. Uh, then you know, a bunch of you folks will come, and we'll have dinner. We'll talk about it a little bit tomorrow, tonight. But tomorrow, we'll then come back, and we're going to talk about both some of the conclusions from this. But you know, this longer term issue of institutionalizing the peace. And my emphasis here is on longer term, because I think one of the things that I'm getting out of this is that there are multiple phases. I don't think we're at ripeness. I actually think your ripeness comment is interesting, because I think that the way that several people have suggested you get to ripeness is with military intervention. You weaken the parties to this thing using force, and that ripens it. It's, and and, and the, the, the damage has been done, but it hasn't been done to some of the critical players. They've actually, you know, actually gained some ground recently. But, but what it suggests is we've got to get to a point of, of some kind of ripeness. But also, between now and then, um, I think uh, PJ was the one that mentioned this, but, you know, process may be enough for some of these players. We can engage in a process, we can move forward, we can make a little bit of gains, uh, it can ripen a little bit, uh, and then you begin something phased. And we talked about grandfathering in different components, or sunsetting different components of this thing. But it, you know, it may be that over a course of five, six, seven, ten years, you actually you know, put a bit of a lid on things now, um, let a couple of parties weaken, watch some of the relationships among some of the outside parties change a little bit, watch some of the inside groups change, move forward there towards more of a political agreement, but not now, but four, five, six, seven years, and then implement. And th so one of the things we're going to talk about tomorrow is what are realistic time frames that actually get us to some place better than this, as opposed to just saying chaos forever? Because I think that's, you know, that, that's, you know, to just sort of throw up our hands and say peace is not possible is inconsistent with our overall mission. We have to sort of find our way to the best way to that. So there, there, there are some very interesting components of this ahead of us. Uh, I think this last session today, which are what are the things that can really flare up and what could that look like, um, will allow you to take the dark imaginations all of you seem to have and put them to good use. Um, and then we will wrap up uh, and, and we'll come back tomorrow for more of it. But why don't you take 15 minutes right now, refresh yourselves, hop around a little bit, and we'll talk to you in a, in a few minutes. <laughs>